Welcome, everyone. This is actually our first European ROAR webinar that was opened up to other AVAC partners. So we welcome other AVAC partners on the line. Um, so today we're going to be talking about um, therapeutic vaccines, or other words, otherwise known as a functional cure, which in layperson's terms can really just mean controlling HIV beyond treatment. Um, and there's some work being done in Europe. And so today we have our two guests who are going to highlight two different trials and consortia that are, that are working in Europe. So the first one is the um, European HIV Alliance, also known as EVA. And this is going, we're going to hear from Sheena McCormick about this particular study that's happening. And then the other one, is, the other consortium is the HIVACAR which stands for Evaluating a Combination of Immune-Based Therapies to Achieve a Functional Cure. Um, they're, both, they're both consortiums that are funded by European Union's Horizon 2020 Research and Innovation Program. Um, so specifically, um, Sheena needs no introduction, but I'll just give you a little bit of her background. Um, She's actually one of Europe's lead HIV prevention researchers and also leading HIV prevention activists. Specifically, she's been working um, as an epidemiologist at University College London as professor of clinical epidemiology. She's been working since 1994 on vaccine trials in Europe and in Africa. And she might be better known for um, being the primary investigator, principal investigator on the PrEP Proud study in the UK. She's also led on microbicide studies, and she manages or heads London's famous Dean Street Sexual Health Clinic for men. Today, she's representing Eva, and she'll be talking about um, their quest for vaccine research, um, over what plans are, but also she's going to be speaking very specifically about the therapeutic vaccine trial that's poised um, to get started. It's already been through three country regulatory approvals. It's a phase 2B trial. It's called an HIV trial in individuals who started ART in primary or chronic infection. And then the, sec and the other, not the second, because we're flipping, but the other presenter that I'd like to welcome today is Dr. Philippe Garcia. He's a senior consultant at Hospital Clinic in Barcelona and researcher on the Biomedical Research Institute team on infectious diseases and AIDS. And he, co he coordinates the HIVACAR consortium and is speaking today specifically about the HIVACAR study. It's a, com it's a phase two clinical trial looking at a combination of strategies for, um, for a cure. It's targeting viral replication and reservoirs. Um, it's a combination of immune-based therapies or otherwise a, you know, as a therapeutic vaccine with antibodies um, and, and latent reversing agents or the kick and kill strategy. So there's a combination of all of those that he'll talk about. And he'll also talk a little bit about the need, why we actually need a therapeutic alternative to um, when we already have lifelong why aren't we always get up? Why are we putting so much money into vaccine and cure when we already have art? So um, let me just check to see if if um, Sheena is here. Uh, Sheena is on the webinar. Okay, Sheena, I was just told you are here. Indeed, that's great news. So if you're here, Sheena, you want to star seven to unmute. And um, I will turn over the floor for you to do your presentations, and then we will um, take the, just clarifying answer, uh, questions, and then we'll go to Dr. Garcia. He can do his presentation, and then when both of you have completed, we'll open it up for a Q&A. So that said, Sheena, take it away, star seven to unmute. Hmm. Um, Levi, is there any way that you can help us with Sheena? I'm not sure if she's actually on via the phone, but I, she's definitely on via web. 
Okay, so if she's on via web, can you unmute her? I don't, there isn't, that uh, option is not available. Hmm. Hold on. Oh, here she is, here she is, hand raised, hand raised. So, um, Gina. Uh, hey, um, hey, Levi, is there a way that, so now she's on as a presenter. Can you allow her to speak? I believe as long as she has a... Oh, so now she's on the telephone. Okay. So now you're on the telephone, Sheena, that's great. So can you press star seven to unmute yourself? Hello. Hi, oh, Tina. Make it? A, oh, yeah. Uh, now we hear you. We hear okay. you. Welcome. So, I'm sorry. I'm on a speakerphone, and um, so I assumed pressing the unmute on the speakerphone would work. And when it didn't work, I was thinking, I don't know what I'm going to do. <laughs> I'm in well, a. Now we got to. Okay. 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 Thank you. Sorry about I, that. I don't know. So, and we're going to keep you here. So I'm going to give you the floor. Thank you. And Cindy, can I can I uh, move the slides on myself? Uh, Levi is going to help you with that. So just uh, just request uh, next slide, and, and and they'll be moved. Okay. So next slide. <laughs> Great. Okay, thanks. Um, so just very briefly uh, to get a sense of the size um, of Efa, and I think I can now tell that the animation is maybe not working, although perhaps it disappears after this one. Um, so 39 partners, 11 countries, three continents, that's Europe, Sub-Saharan Africa, and the US, and infinite enthusiasm, I've said, spanning the basic science, clinical sciences, biostatistical, and the community uh, disciplines. So if I say next, yeah, I think then maybe you'll just see where those countries are. You do the next slide. No, you don't. Okay, so maybe none of the animations will work. That could be a problem, but not to worry. So it's 28 million euros, 22 of which come from the European Commission, and I've put the grant reference there, and then 6 million uh, from the Swiss government uh, for the Swiss partners, and that's the grant reference there. Next slide, please. And the primary goals of the whole consortium is to develop a multidisciplinary uh, vaccine platform um, for both prophylactic and therapeutic. And I know um, that I think it put more emphasis on the prophylactic um, in, in the um, uh, advertised um, uh, a brief, but I will speak more about the therapeutic today simply because we've got, we've got further with, um, with those and the prophylactic are still in discovery. So that's kind of the second bullet. We want to move novel preventative vaccines into clinical development, but they are, they are moving, but they're not there yet. And then we want to obviously identify any correlates associated with the control of replication um, following an immunological intervention and to establish a strong scientific basis for further development. So a lot of EFA is about how do we select candidates how do we deselect them, and how do we do this um, efficiently? So next slide, please. So these are the kind of principles and, and progress. I, can you see that mouse? If I'm, I can see the mouse, but can you see a mouse? Uh, a mouse. A, a pointer. No, it's probably oh, just me. No. Okay. We, so the, I can. The blue box, the, you can see it? Can you see that? No, 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 no. Negative. No, no, no. Oh, okay. Blue box at the top is um, the kind of vaccine candidates that we were, we were thinking of when the grant went in. Obviously, you check the genetic, the chemistry side of things and stability, and you can make no-go decisions at that point in time. But if you go forward, um, then we test in, in the preclinical uh, stage. Um, we're interested in the magnitude and the functionality of the responses, um, and you can make no-go decisions at that point in time. But if you keep going on, now we're in the orangey box, um, then we would look at immunogenicity and safety in non-human primates, um, and then move them to the phase uh, 0-1 uh, trials. 
and ultimately, obviously, onto the trials where you're assessing um, efficacy. And we're aiming to have a core set of assays, a large core set of assays, to help um, uh, deselect and select candidates. Next slide, please. And so this kind of works, I suppose, if you think of it in these three phases of experimental medicine at the beginning, moving to adaptive trials, and then the phase two. So you can see there we're looking at the possibility of RNA um, uh, um, immunogens um, and DNA. We're not going to look at the GTU DNA in this experimental phase, and we're not looking at NIVAC. And we would boost with the CN54 protein. So already some selection process has gone on, some of it pragmatic. And then moving through into the phase two uh, stage of things. Next slide, please. So at the kickoff meeting, um, this is what we were planning to do. And I put a circle around that top box on the left. We were going to do parallel trials um, with uh, actually similar vaccine strategies, but parallel in the sense of one trial will be done in people who had started their treatment during primary infection and another trial in people who had started in chronic infection. And we've already made efficiencies, decided to make efficiencies by combining those two populations in one protocol because they are actually following the same schedule of visits. And we can divide the two populations by sort of stratifying that in the randomization. So we can manage that within a single trial. Next slide, please. So this is what we plan to do, a randomized a phase one two therapeutic vaccine trial with a DNA and an MVA in individuals who start antiretrovirals during primary or chronic infection. But then this happened, and this is where I think in the next slide, my animation is not going to work, but let's go to the next slide and see what it holds. Yes. So in behind that graph is the uh, citation of the paper from the group at NIH who looked at a monoclonal antibody called redolucimab um, in non-human primates. And what you're seeing there is the difference in the ability to control the virus in the absence of treatment. So in the top graph there, you see there are quite a few blobs, colored blobs going along the line flat. These each represent a monkey who did not have a viral rebound was able to control their virus after a, a preliminary um, viral rebound. There were some monkeys, as you can see, above the line, the flat line, that did actually still have some uh, 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 viral load detected. But compared to the control group in the, in the block below, where all of the monkeys um, had rebound viral load, uh, you see there was a significant uh, difference. And group A, it had antiretroviral therapy and then uh, the alpha-4 beta-7 monoclonal antibody, um, which is similar but not identical to vedolucinab, um, and then they had stopped their treatment and had this success, whereas the B control group had had just an immunoglobulin G. So next slide. Now we have to be a little bit more clever because we're looking not only at the vaccine, we're looking at it on its own and then in combination with vedolucinab and looking at vedolucinab on its own too. Same population, but now instead of one experimental group, we've got three. And that's what led us to think on the next slide <laughs> that this was an opportunity to use a multi-arm, multi-stage trial design, which is something we've used in cancer trials in particular in the Stampede trial of prostate cancer, where we had several interventions that we wanted to look at that were more or less ready at the same time. So there's an option in the box uh, on the left of the slide where you could do each of these trials independently. So you've got experiment A versus control, experiment B versus control, C, D, and E. It's five comparisons, it's 10 groups, and it's five separate trials. But by combining them in the next box into the five parallel groups with a single control, you've got six arms and one trial. And it's obvious that you're using less resources, the cost of comparison is much less, less bureaucracy, and a larger number of the participants are actually exposed to an active agent. Next slide, please. 
So the hypothesis of the trial that we are hoping to start in the next month or two is that the therapeutic vaccination will induce de novo immune responses and boost existing responses that in control, improve the control of HIV replication. We agreed that a clinically relevant viral load response to the vaccine will be defined as a delay to rebound of at least 10,000 copies per mil confirmed. But delucimab acts through a different mechanism uh, in the gut to limit the viral replication. So it seems most likely that these two interventions will be synergistic. Next slide. So the efficacy, the primary outcome measure, is really a confirmation of HIV RNA more than or equal to 10,000 copies per mil uh, on two separate samples. But actually, there may be other reasons, clinical reasons or other reasons, that people resume the antiretroviral therapy before they reach this virological endpoint. So any resumption of antiretroviral therapy um, for any reason um, during the analytic treatment interruption, we would consider to be um, a, a primary outcome. And then the safety outcome is a clinical decision to discontinue the regimen for an adverse event considered related to product. Next slide, please. In terms of secondary outcomes, we're interested in the level of total DNA, um, the cell-associated HIV RNA, and then immunologically, the response rate, magnitude, and polyfunctionality of the vaccine-induced CD4 and CD8 T cell responses. And then there are additional safety ones, so more than or equal to a severe solicited adverse event in terms of local or systemic reactions, including lab abnormalities, any AE that led to an interruption, perhaps not considered to be um, uh, related to the product, but nonetheless, if it's an AE that leads the participant to decide to interrupt, can't interested in that. And then in terms of um, the analytic treatment interruption, of course, an adverse event that led to resuming treatment early, the time to viral load suppression after restarting ART, because we would hope that is quick as expected, serious adverse events, and then a capture all adverse events. Next slide, please. So I couldn't put all of the inclusion criteria up because they're about 18. So I just picked out selected ones, and I lumped together um, uh, under some categories uh, others. So HIV-1 infected, age 18 to 65 at screening, weighing over or equal to 50 kilograms, and that's really a, a, a safety measure in relation to the amount of blood that we need to uh, take during the trial. And then factors that are, are linked to sort of mitigating the risk for individuals because we're asking them uh, to interrupt their treatment, and the dear CD4 count that's greater than 300, a current CD4 count that's greater than 600, a viral load less than 50 at screening. To have started the combination ART after 2009, when we, we know they're particularly good drugs, and on treatment for at least one year prior to screening with undetectable viral loads um, during that time. Oh, I'm, I'm looking at a message from you, Cindra, on the screen. Um, Okay, so willing to take precautions to prevent onward transmission during ATI and willing to avoid um, pregnancy. Because obviously during the analytic treatment interruption, it's possible that viral load will rebound to a level where uh, the individual might be able to pass it on. So it would be necessary to take extra precautions in that time. Uh, next slide, please. This is selected exclusion. So HIV-2 infection or receipt of previous HIV vaccines, which makes it difficult to um, interpret the um, immunological uh, results. A viral load um, that was greater than 200 copies on two occasions in the 12 months prior to screening, previous interruptions in treatment, or virological failure with um, resistance. This is all to try and protect um, uh, um, participants uh, against the fact we're asking them to interrupt their treatment. And then there's the, the usual things in terms of current medical conditions or lab abnormalities that we think need investigation and perhaps would make it less safe for somebody to take part. 
um, past history of PML, cardiac, neurological cancer, severe reaction to a vaccination, um, and a family history of rheumatoid arthritis because um, there was an individual um, who developed rheumatoid arthritis who was exposed to the DNA vaccine in one previous trial. Next slide, please. So the schema, um, uh, uh, simply, I guess, is a sort of treatment period in blue, lighter blue there, from week 0 to 24. Actually, the vaccines, which are the green arrows, are just given at week 0 and 4, that's the DNA, and the MVA is given at week 12. And then the vedolizumab infusion, or placebo, would be given at weeks 2, 4, and 8, then at 16, 24, and at week 32, provided the individual hasn't restarted their treatment. And then the interruption could go on for 24 weeks with weekly measures of viral load for the first 12 weeks and then fortnightly for the next 12 weeks. Um, and then we've allowed 12 weeks to uh, ensure that somebody uh, resuppresses after they start. Um, and you'll see in the boxes there the reasons why we would not allow people to stop treatment at week 24. So if there'd been any clinical progression during that first 24 weeks, or some of their parameters, such as CD4 or viral load, suggest that it's not uh, a good idea, or they're not willing to proceed, or they've fallen pregnant. So we're asking people to take precautions against pregnancy, but we know that still can happen in trials. And then in the second box, um, there might be some reasons why people should restart treatment um, uh, other than the 10,000 copies. So if the CD4 had fallen to 350 or less, any evidence of disease progression or uh, pregnancy. Next slide, please. So I've, I've put this one up, and it's just really to leave it for you for posterity. It was, it was quite tricky explaining the randomization, but if you look at those blocks of, box with the sort of sick men, it's to try to explain that both the clinic staff and the participants will know whether they're on an injection-only schedule, an infusion-only schedule, or a combination of the two. And that's because of the very intense schedule for the injection and infusion, and the onus that puts on participants in terms of the number of visits and the interventions. But within each of those groups, there will be one person um, who receives uh, the placebo uh, intervention for every three who receive the active. Next slide, please. So we're aiming to enroll 88 to 192 uh, participants uh, who are patients, I guess, as well. Um, we'll, we'll be enrolling them through the their, their clinicians who, um, who look after them across six centers, six countries. Actually, it's more than six centers. It's uh, 10 centers. 11 centers even. <laughs> so I'm, looking, I'm looking at Cecilia, who's, in, who's a statistician. She's with me in the room here. Um, they'll randomize, as I say, to active products or placebo in the ratio of three to one within each schedule. Uh, it's four arms, therefore, three active, one placebo. And there are two stages to this design with an interim analysis when 11 participants in the placebo group have resumed their treatment. Now, we think, based on previous studies, that that will happen after 88 people have been enrolled. So we will pause the enrollment uh, after we've enrolled 88. And the final sample size could be 192, but it will depend on how many arms proceed um, beyond the interim analysis. So if we look at the next slide, Hello. Oh, thank you. <laughs> um, uh, and it's actually very reassuring that you're passing the slides on because I know you can still hear me, which is great. <laughs> um, so here you are, um, a, a little bit of a repeat there in the box about the eligibility, the randomization, and here you see the product. So the GTU multi-HIV B clade DNA, which is at week 0 and 4, and then the ANRS MVA, also clade B, um, uh, at week 12 or the vedolizumab um, at the weeks I showed in the schedule, or the combination of the two and the placebo control. And the placebo, as I mentioned, is actually divided into these three groups. Okay, next slide, please. And then this is, uh, this is to try to explain um, how we based our, our sample size and how we thought of it. 
So if you look at the column that's headed interim analysis, and I'll take you down, remind you of the primary uh, outcome, which is the time from treatment interruption to the earliest of HIV RNA greater than or equal to 10,000, or resuming antiretroviral therapy, then our anticipation based on previous studies is that 72% of people will have reached that time point by six weeks after they stop the, the, uh, their ART. So that's by about week 30. We've set the probability high because we don't want to reject something that's got a, a possibility of, of, uh, of, of event, uh, of, of, um, of, um, of efficacy, thank you, Cecilia. <laughs> um, and the critical value that, uh, that we're therefore using is actually a hazard ratio of, of one. So you more or less have to have the same proportion or numbers of people who've actually uh, reached that endpoint in an experimental arm to, uh, to reject uh, uh, that, that arm at that point in time. But the final uh, hazard ratio we're interested in is 0.46, and that you'll see from the note at the bottom, it, it kind of relates to an absolute reduction of 50%. So a vaccine efficacy, if you like, of 50%, which I think you might find easier to understand than the, uh, than the hazard ratio. So the principle of the multi-arm, multi-stage is that at the interim analysis, you're permissive about letting things go through. Um, but at the final analysis, you are applying um, the rigorous uh, two-sided um, p-value and uh, the, usual, uh, uh, the usual kind of uh, strength of power. So it will be 92% in the last column you'll see at the final analysis. Next slide, please. And then just to give you an idea of what might happen if we did, were to stop one arm and what we would say, well, in this uh, study, it would only be 27 participants and six weeks off the length of the trial compared to all arms continuing until completion. So we do get some savings, not quite as much as you get in the study where you wouldn't have to wait for the 24 weeks before you've got your first outcomes uh, arising. Next slide, please. So the organization, uh, INSERM ANRS is the sponsor, and we have a clinical center. So there are three um, in Paris, um, one in Spain, in Barcelona, and then two centers in uh, UK, one at Imperial College St. Mary's and one at Chelsea in Westminster. In Italy, we have one center, and in Germany, one center, and one in Switzerland. We're coordinating things here, and our community partner has been the European AIDS Treatment Group. Next slide, please. And I wanted just to put this up for a placeholder, really. There are sub-studies where we are hoping to take a lot of blood um, through leukapheresis in a, a small participants taking, uh, who are participating in those three of those four centers, possibly Spain later on, um, lymph node biopsy and the GI biopsy, either a sigmoid colon or rectal. The microbiome is to look at the uh, microbiology of the, of the gut. It's not flagged as a sub-study, but we do know that not all participants in the center will take part. Coming in the next version of the protocol, version 5, will be social science. That's not yet submitted, and that's under review internally at the moment. And then the French would like to do, collect some genital secretions. Again, that's the newest idea. But you can see that this is a study that attracts sub-studies. Next slide, please. So the enrollment target for centre, um, uh, we've made some modifications to this, um, and so we're asking Switzerland uh, to collect uh, to enrol a few more. I don't think that can add up to 88 there, but this is obviously something we will track um, as we go through. France will uh, enrol an extra two, um, and Switzerland to make up for the four that Spain uh, cannot enrol in this first part of the study. So it does add up to 88. My apologies. Next slide, please. And this is where we are with the review. So we've, we're already on version four of the protocol, having submitted in the UK, Italy, and Switzerland. We've had a lot of comments that have required changes to the participant information sheet. Um, but we've also, most notably, been asked to incorporate a data monitoring committee safety review of the first 12 participants after they pass their first um, safety assessment um, in the study. So that's an extra review that we had not put in the original protocol. 
And then we've made some changes around pregnancy, clarifying that issue around pregnancy. This would have happened anyway, but we've made it more explicit um, in the protocol about restarting treatment if, if pregnancy occurs and not stopping treatment if pregnancy occurs. And then it hasn't been submitted yet in Germany, Spain, and France. Next slide, please. I'm nearly there, Sindra. Oh, that doesn't, is that the next slide? That was a bit unexpected. Um, I'm not sure what that's doing there. We can move on to the next slide. <laughs> that's a rogue slide. Um, so the issues, I just wanted to kind of say, what were the issues we've kind of dealt with as we've gone along? Well, there was a lot of, uh, obviously, discussion about the antiretroviral therapy interruption, the analytic treatment interruption, in the first year or so of the study. And the European AIDS Treatment Group were brilliant in helping with, this, with us with this. Um, and it went out to consultation, and Simon Collins and Richard Jeffries, who's written on um, this, uh, this topic, reviewed the protocol and the information sheet for us. So we wanted to make sure we had a strong and eligibility criteria around CD4 and viral load, and around the, what happens to them in the first 24 weeks to mitigate any risks in stopping treatment. And I think the query, really the big query, was could this still be an issue for those who started in primary? Um, but we tried to make that explicit in the, in the information sheet. And I am not sure in the emerging data that's coming through that really there is that much difference. Weekly viral load monitoring, it's very intense for the participants. And I'm really sorry about that. But we felt that was the safest way in the first 12 weeks and monthly CD4. Um, and then you know already what we've decided about the resumption. And it was important to make sure this is acceptable to the European community because the ACTG in America have asked uh, that resumption is at 1,000 copies uh, of viral load. We don't think many uh, participants will need to switch their treatment because we think most of them will be on integrase inhibitors uh, and Truvada, but we will obviously track that as we go through. There is the issue about transmission to negative partners. This has happened in one case in a previous study. And then the ethics committees were particularly concerned around uh, PML um, and whether or not we should be doing JCV um, antibodies. And then recruitment, we know, is going to be challenging because of the intensity of the schedule. So we don't know what that challenge will be yet, but we will find out. Next slide, please. Um, so next steps, we're waiting for version 4 and product release. We anticipate these will come late June. Uh, and then I mentioned these two pauses. The first one after 12 have been slowly enrolled. We'll only enroll one individual a week for the first four weeks and then two a week for the next four weeks. And I do wonder now we're having a data monitoring committee where that's actually over the top. But it is what we put in the, um, in the protocol. And then there's a pause after 88 has been enrolled at four or more per week for the interim analysis. And if necessary, then enrollment will be competitive. And I'm pretty sure that is the last, apart from my acknowledgement slide. And I'm really sorry, Sindra, because I know we, it was my fault for starting late, but I've also gone over no, no, no. no apologies at all. No apologies. Um, I will um, invite questions for clarification. So you um, start seven to unmute your phone, just please for clarification. I haven't seen any come in on the board, so I'm also aware of our time constraints. So with that, I just might pass it over to Dr. Garcia to um, talk about Hivakar and his study. Sheena, thanks so much. Pleasure. So, um, Dr. Garcia, you just have to hit star seven to unmute your line. Hello? Hmm. Star seven to unmute. Uh, Levi, do you know if um, he's on the line, he's on the phone, or the web? Uh, he should be on both, actually. Okay, okay. 
So, Dr. Sant Garcia, we still can't hear you. So, if you could hit star seven on your phone. Can you hear me or not? Yeah, we can hear you now. Great. Welcome. Thank okay. You. Thank you. Thank you. I'm sorry for, because I was in another computer. Okay. 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 Um, I would like to, to thank uh, um, the organizer for inviting me to, to give this uh, talk. Um, we can go to the second slide if you want. Okay, I would uh, like to introduce uh, a bit uh, about what are the current strategies for HIV remission. And we have now four main strategies, the shock and kill uh, strategy, the immune-based therapies, a combination of, bo of both strategies and uh, our approach. Next slide, please. Then it seems that in the last few years, the shock and kill strategy is uh, gaining weight in the in the field i mean what uh, chuck and kill many people are, are working in chuck and kill um, less people are working in use in use based therapies next slide please this is based in in the there are a lot of studies uh, talking or working in intensification and tratamental therapy in controllers and the in latency reversing agents next slide please and there are some data, this is a mathematical model uh, that uh, was published by uh, the Siliciano group uh, a few years ago. And they uh, predict that uh, if we can obtain a drop of uh, uh, the level of reservoir of above uh, four logs, then it is possible that we can have, a, 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 we can maintain a remission even for life. Next slide. In fact, this is what we can see in this uh, type of patient. This type of patient has been described. The, this is the Visconti cohort. These patients are uh, describe a kind of patient that have a very low level of uh, viral reservoir, and that uh, uh, and this patient were uh, uh, started therapy when they were in primary infection. And what we can see is that uh, when this patient that started, who started therapy during primary infection, if they discontinue therapy after uh, a time on antiretroviral therapy, the viral load don't, uh, doesn't uh, increase. And it, it seems that the reason uh, it has not to be with the immune system, but it has to be with a very low level of viral reservoir. Okay, next slide. Then uh, what it seems with this to uh, last slide, the, the mathematical model on this slide from, from this county patients, it seems that it is enough to, uh, to, to have a decrease, a significant decrease of vital reservoir to uh, obtain, uh, to achieve a, a vital remission. But uh, I would like to, to show you the data of one of our patients in our, in our clinics. Um, uh, to show that this is, it could be not the case. Uh, um, the problem is that I think, I think that this is, uh, it has an animation in this poll, probably that we cannot show. We can go to the next slide. Okay, then uh, in, the, in the first, in, the, in, the, in this slide, we can see the, the animation and then we can explain without any problem. This is uh, one patient that uh, this patient were on antiretroviral therapy. You can see the, the red line in the, in, in, the white, uh, in the white part of the, of the graph. And then this uh, patient, uh, this continuum antiretroviral therapy, this is the gray part of the, of the slide. And then in the, in, you can see that uh, there was not a rebound of viral load. And this means that this patient could be considered a post-treatment controller. It is pretty similar to what we can see in patients in the Visconti trial. In fact, this patient, as you can see in the, in the, in the other two lines, uh, they have, uh, this, pardon, this patient has a very low level of total and integrated DNA, DNA that this is similar to of what we uh, saw in the Visconti trial. The patient, this patient has also a very low level of reservoir. Next slide please. But uh, conversely to what we uh, uh, saw, in, see, pardon, in, in the Visconti trial, 
we can see here that this patient has a very high uh, CTL uh, responses. And these responses increase very high when the patient discontinues therapy. Okay, next slide. Then, um, it's a problem with animation, don't worry. In, in this, uh, in, be, below this, uh, this part, these two boxes, brown boxes, we can see that the patient had an interruption of therapy uh, one year before this second interruption of therapy. In this uh, first interruption of therapy, the viral load level uh, increased uh, to a very high level. This, there are then two differences between the first time that this patient is continuous therapy and the second time that the patient is continuous therapy. What we can see is that the first time the patient is continuous therapy, there is a high level of an antiviral therapy rebound, and the second time we cannot see this, uh, this um, this, uh, this uh, so high barrel long rebound. Then what is our, our hypothesis? The bad hypothesis is that uh, if you have low CTL responses with low reservoir, you are going to see a viral rebound. So you, you are going to have a viral rebound. Then what, uh, what we need to have uh, to, to avoid the viral rebound, to avoid the viral rebound, we need a very high level of CTL responses a very low uh, reservoir, at least in chronic infected patients. This is what this is our hypothesis, and this completely different of what uh, Visconti patients of Siliciano mathematical model uh, predict. Next slide, please. Then we uh, the other approach that uh, it could be the immune-based therapies. Next slide, please. There are a number of uh, strategies that we can uh, do, therapeutic vaccine, gene therapy, administration of uh, uh, monoclonal antibodies, uh, uh, even adoptive immunotherapy. Next slide, please. But uh, we think that uh, both strategies can be combined. Next, extra next slide, please. Then it seems, uh, or, or at least other anima uh, part of mathematical model, say that it's possible that if you combine uh, the CTL responses with the uh, drop in viral reservoir, next slide, okay, uh, you can have a higher uh, number of patients with, uh, uh, with uh, control of viral load after uh, therapy interruption. The, the idea is that if you decrease the reservoir with uh, with uh, latency uh, reversing agents and you and you increase the uh, the immune uh, increase the immune responses with therapeutic vaccination then the number of post treatment control could be higher this is the model of uh, uh, the alan Pedersen group next slide please but even in this model we think that the combination could not be enough to, to obtain a, a, a remission of a, a viral load. This is, uh, there are some reasons we, uh, uh, I would like to show you here four of them. The first is uh, because there are problems with the host immune environment. There are problems with the inflammatory environment. There are problems with the uh, tolerance of the patients. We can have also problems with expansion of the persistent clones, which are exhausted and uh, target escape variants. Uh, the third problem could be that uh, there could be a, a no correct dendritic uh, cell antigen presentation. And finally, there could be a problem because uh, there could be B cell follicle sanctuary that permits persistent productive virus infection. And then, how we can uh, solve these problems. Next slide. Well, the first, uh, the first problem, the, how we can solve the host uh, immune environment problems. We can use adjuvant or we can use the, the same uh, drug that uh, are uh, being used now in, in cancer. This is the anti-tolerance drug. This is the uh, for example, the, the anti-PD-1 or anti-PD-L1 antibodies, uh, this uh, reduce the tolerance to, uh, of the new system and then the uh, CTL responses, the responses against the, the HIV increase. 
then this is one possibility that this is a, this has been a success in cancer. This next slide, please. The second possibility is that if we have if we improve with a therapeutic vaccine immune responses and these immune responses target the same uh, uh, virus that the patient has uh, in, in, inside uh, his body, then we cannot do anything uh, with, uh, uh, with this patient. Then the idea is if it's possible that we can redirect the response towards vulnerable sites and away for, from irrelevant epitopes. And this is what we propose in IVACAR. Next slide, please. Then we also uh, propose in IVACAR to target the dendritic cells. Next slide. And finally, to focus in the B cell follicle and to enter this uh, B cell follicle, one possibility is to use inter, uh, interleukin uh, 15. Pardon. Next slide. Okay, we will uh, focus in the in the IVACAR project uh, in these uh, two parts to target uh, um, part of the virus that has been uh, has not been uh, mutated, and second to uh, to target the dendritic cell. Uh, therefore, IVACAR is evaluating a combination of, of immune-based therapies to achieve remission from HIV. If the project aims at change the current paradigm of HIV treatment by obtaining remission of uh, HIV infection. Next slide, please. Okay, um, uh, we would like to obtain or to have new cost effective and viable uh, therapeutic strategies uh, because we know that uh, these are uh, needed for effective control of HIV epidemic. The uh, antiretroviral therapy has proven to be highly effective to prevent clinical progression and death, but uh, is enabled to eradicate HIV infection. And uh, the significant cost of antiretroviral therapy constitutes constitu uh, important limitation for widespread, widespread uh, use in developing countries, but also in the developing world. And then we think that a safe, affordable, and scalable a therapeutic alternative for HIV infection could address both the individual and public health limitations associated with lifelong uh, antiretroviral therapy. Next slide, please. Okay, uh, we think that one possibility is, or, or these are the two objectives of the study. The first objective is the immune-based therapy. So it's a combination of immune-based therapy with uh, uh, latency reversing agents uh, will be investigated to understand uh, uh, if it helps to eliminate viral reservoir and induce new and effective HIV immune responses that contain viral rebound after uh, antiretroviral therapy uh, discontinuation. And the, the, in parallel to this uh, in immune-based therapy, we are going to perform a psychosocial and economical research. And then the idea is to perform a survey to, uh, to study the ethical, economical, psychological, uh, psychosocial consequences of, uh, of um, functional cure. Then uh, we are going to conduct a, a detailed survey to, to know what is the feeling of the of the participants and the people living with HIV in, in this uh, topic. And also we will perform an economic study just to predict what could be the consequences of uh, uh, obtaining or achieving the uh, functional cure in a part of the HIV uh, infected uh, population. Next slide, please. Okay, this is um, what we are going to use uh, in the, the um, part, in, in the upper part of the slide, we can see that we are going to use therapeutic vaccines, two kinds of therapeutic vaccines. We are going to combine, to, comp to compare pers or personalized vaccine, the name is Ivacar, and a rational design vaccine, the name is Ivarna. And we are going to combine this therapeutic vaccine with broadly neutralizing antibodies and with latency reversing agents. This uh, therapeutic vaccine has, uh, these two uh, therapeutic vaccines have some, uh, some things in common. First, in the, uh, they are RNA vaccines. Uh, second, they, and we select the um, 
antigen that uh, encode this RNA uh, in, in two different ways. In the first way, we select this antigen in the pardon in the the Ibarna vaccine. We select this uh, this um, um, antigens based in a study that has been performed in Peru in 2000 people living with HIV that uh, we uh, saw that uh, some uh, CTA responses were uh, beneficial for these people and then we decide to select these responses that were good for these people and to uh, to use these CTA responses to uh, to uh, manufacture a vaccine targeting in this part of the virus that were targeted for uh, by these CTL responses that were ha that had the pe the people that uh, that control uh, better the the virus. This is the first uh, the first uh, vaccine, the, Iba the Ibarna vaccine, and the Ibacar vaccine is a personal is a personalized vaccine. This personalized vaccine, what we do is pretty similar of what uh, uh, it. Uh, it, it now is been doing with the with the genotypic mutations in with antiretroviral therapy. The difference is that uh, now what we do with when we are going to start uh, antiretroviral therapy in one uh, one patient, what we do is to uh, to draw the blood and then to look at the resistance, the possible resistance to the antiretroviral therapy. What we do. Here is exactly the same, but not the resistance to antiretroviral therapy, but the resistance to the immune system. Then we uh, will sequence the virus. We will look at the mutation that the virus have against the uh, immune system that this person has, and then uh, we select those epitopes, those part of the uh, of the virus that has not been mutated, and then we will manufacture a vaccine, a personalized vaccine for each uh, patient, uh, and the idea is to target those parts of the vaccine that has not been mutated. This has been uh, performed already in cancer with a very good results in, in melanoma. In fact, uh, there are two papers, two recent papers uh, published in July 2017 with very good results with the same approach. The same vaccine, RNA vaccine, uh, given in the same doses that we are going to use in the same schedule, intranodally like uh, our vaccine, and also personalized. And they obtain uh, a, a very high level of, of immune responses with a control of cancer. And we, we are going to look at, in our uh, actually infected patients, if we have the same results with our personalized vaccine. And finally, we combine uh, the trimix. The trimix is a combination of uh, uh, products that are able, and we think, or we think that are able to uh, to target the native cells. Then, with this three combination, we we combine a new kind of vaccine, the RNA vaccine, a new uh, way to select the the epitopes that we are targeting with the, our vaccines, um, both with Ibarna or Ibacat, and we sell, we uh, target the dendritic cells with the trimix. Next slide, please. Philippe, I want to just give you a one-minute time check. Yes, no, 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 okay, I am, I am finishing. Thank I am you. finishing. Thank you. Sorry. All right. Then uh, now, um, what we can see here that we combine these therapeutic vaccines with uh, with antibody in our um, uh, with the ten ten seventy four. This antibody has demonstrated in, in chronic HIV infected patients that is able to decrease the viral load, and we combine this with uh, latency reversing agents. And uh, we will use uh, romidepsin that has demonstrated that uh, the virus is transcripted with uh, when we use this kind of uh, drug. Next slide, please. Okay, this is the uh, the work that we will do in this uh, next three four years. Next slide. This is the schedule. Uh, we will uh, uh, vaccinate uh, 56 patients, uh, 14 patients each arm. And you can see the arm one we will vaccinate uh, with all the patients will receive uh, um, the antibodies, the 10 10 for plus romidepsin. And we will uh, compare uh, in these uh, three different ways to, uh, uh, to vaccine these patients. Next slide, please. 
uh, well, this is an in international interdisciplinary uh, um, study, and all these groups are involved in this in this uh, study. And I think this is the last slide. No, or next slide. I think this is the last. Okay. Mm -hmm. Thank you so much, Philippe Garcia, for that. Um, I know we're at the top of the hour, but I do want to open it up if, if we can have Sheena and, and Philippe stay for a few minutes. And for those of you who can also stay, uh, if there are any um, questions, you can press star seven to unmute, or you can type them in the message board. Um, while we're waiting for their, our audience to, for with questions, I do have a, one or two. Sheena, I wanted to just ask you um, about the ethics of the treatment interruptions, um, because won't this maybe have a bearing immunologically if people go off treatment? I know they're being heavily monitored, but can you speak something to that? So, the, um, so obviously the ethics committees were uh, had, did query that um, uh, to uh, quite a degree, but I think the most important discussion that we had had that informed the ethics committee's opinion was the one that we'd had with um, with the uh, EATG um, appointed experts, really, with Simon Collins and then with Richard Jeffries. Um, I'm not sure quite what you mean, Sindra, about. The, I mean, if you if the, when the virus rebounds, it would it would boost the immune responses. Mm. Um, so um, I, I'm not sure that they would be harmful as such. I, mean, um, the I guess the virus itself is harmful. Right. Okay. So virological responses. So so there were the so virus. So where the, go ahead. Go ahead. It, it, exactly. So all the concern was around the viral replication. And, mm -hmm. and how much damage that might be able to to do, and the the ceiling of ten thousand was felt to be, um, you know, a, a reasonable one, and you know, and, and that it, it will be nothing long lasting in terms of impact on life expectancy or quality of life. So the other concern um, that the ethics committees raised, which was also one, of course, shared by everybody, was was the emergence of resistance during that that period. Um, mm -hmm. And if you look at the old studies, then there's a relatively high proportion of people who uh, develop resistance and treatment interruption um, phases. But with the new drugs, that risk is really very much lower. So um, so that was the other the other concern. Um, what about resistance? Mm -hmm. Okay. So I, th I think we, we, you know, you can't completely say it's not there, and that's why in the information sheet we've we've tried to make that clear. Uh, the information sheet is about 22 pages long, and um, the other way in which the ATG is going to help us, which I think is really important, is to provide a sort of buddy system local to each of the centres, so that there can be this peer um, support um, and discussion. Um, uh, so that people, we can be reasonably confident, I hope, that people have understood um, uh, what, what the risks are and what the study is doing to minimize those risks. Great, thank you. Um, anyone want to, from the audience, want to pipe up with a question? Because I have a million questions. I, I do realize that we're over time, but I do have a question for Dr. Garcia. Unless there's others from on the line who want to ask a question, now's your chance. All right, um, then I will take the liberty. So I was, you were talking about um, these personalized vaccines, um, mm -hmm. and I was wondering. I, I get that that would be great for proof of concept, but I wonder is this something that would be feasible to scale? Or that's not even the intention. It's just, you know, is this something that could be replicable, on, you know, as a viable vaccine okay, uh, at some point? Yeah, it, it depends on the vaccine that we are going to use and the result that we obtain. That if uh, if uh, we obtain, for example, uh, a number of, pay of people that are uh, that are able to control the viral load 
mm, in a high proportion, first and second, mm, mm, uh, the um, the vaccine that you are going to use is the vaccine that we use is uh, this um, this RNA vaccine is this pretty is I think is feasible not for a, a preventive vaccine for sure but yes for a therapeutic vaccines. What I mean is that if you obtain, uh, uh, for example, I don't know, uh, 30 or 40 percent of, of people that are able to control the viral load for life, and uh, this means that we are going to prepare a vaccine for for these uh, people, and you you can sequence the virus. So this is pretty similar to what we are doing with uh, with the genotypic part of or genotypic mutation that we are we could do for the for therapy. This part is pretty similar, and the second part this this is the to prepare the vaccine is is cheap. It's not very um, it's not very costly. First and second. Is feasible because uh, the RNA vaccine uh, to prepare the vaccine is very easy, and then I think it's feasible. Then, for for sure, it it is a, a, a proof of concept, and we need to demonstrate that it's uh, this is the case. Thank you. Thanks for that. Um, do we have any other questions from the line? I realize that this was pretty high, heavy silence, and um, I want to thank both Sheena and Philippe for your presentations and just say that if there are other follow-up questions um, to AVAC, to the AVAC team, we're welcome to take them and perhaps also refer to our, um, to our guests today, Sheena and Philippe. So with that, thanks so much. Um, and we might be knocking on your door to help us answer some more questions. Um, and I think we'll, we'll stop there unless you have any last at last things to say about therapeutic vaccines, either one of you. No, I don't think no. Felipe, we, we're having a great adventure together. <laughs> <laughs> I think so. Well, well, thanks for your scientific leadership as always. Thank you, Sindran. Thank you for organizing right. this. Okay, Bye. thank you so much. Bye-bye. Bye. 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 Bye.